for film studies brain power in this audience. Uh, um, I'm Carol Becker, I'm Dean of the School of the Arts, and we're really excited. Um, I want to welcome you to the second annual Saul and Dorothy Kitt Film Noir Festival hosted by Columbia University School of the Arts. And this festival has been the dream and passion of Columbia College alumnus Gordon Kitt, who originated the festival as a tribute to his parents and their deep love for film and literature, the arts, and particularly for the genre of film noir. And Gordon, uh, now a retired attorney from Washington, D.C., has been deeply committed to bringing this festival to Columbia, generously supporting it and also supporting students in their study of film at the School of the Arts, and we're very grateful to him for all of that. He has become a great friend of the schools as well as of our film program, and I thank him for his gift in support of the festival and really for his ongoing engagement with his content and with the school. He cares deeply about film noir and about film and now also about the school. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank the incomparable Rob King, who is Associate Professor of Film and Media Studies at the School of the Arts, and he is the author of several books, numerous articles, particularly within the genre of comedy and silent film. He's greatly admired within the field of film studies as one of his leading scholars. And his most recent publication is Hokum, the Early Sound, Slapstick, Short, and Depression Era Mass Culture. And he's worked tirelessly and closely with Gordon Kitt on this festival. And as always, he's done a magnificent job. So I want to thank him as well. Um, we also are very fortunate to have Gordon with us tonight as a friend. Um, I invite him to the podium now to say a few words about his very interesting and inspiring intent for the festival and to tell us about his very interesting and inspired parents for whom this festival is named. So, Gordon Kidd. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Becker, and uh, thanks to everybody at Columbia who's helped to make the festival a reality. And uh, thank all of you for coming here to the festival tonight. This is the second year in a 10-year series of festivals exclusively devoted to film noir. The festival has been endowed uh, in the honor of my parents, who were avid film goers. My first exposure to films was at a family outing to the local drive-in in Houston, Texas. I don't know whether they have drive-ins anymore, but it was quite an experience as a young man. Um, as you might recall, they, at the drive-in they had these metal speakers that they would attach to the window and you'd roll the window up and the cars would get steamy and the, uh, the, the windows would get fogged up and you, you couldn't see the movie very well. And the, the speakers were these metal tin boxes that, um, uh, that had a very echoey sound. Uh, it was a far cry from what we have now in, in the Adobe stereo digital era. Uh, I do have to recall sitting in the back seat of our Ford Fairlane, which was a car in the 1960s and not a 1990s uh, film character. <laughs> I was in my pajamas, looking on a uh, stick of cinnamon candy, watching a double feature of um, th the three, uh, three Stooges in Orbit, and uh, Crosby and Hope's Road to Hong Kong. A uh, family outing at the drive-in. This is the typical sort of American dream experience. Now you might wonder, you know, how did I go from watching comedies at a drive-in to endowing a film noir festival? Well, failure, which is the shadow of noir, is also part of the American dream. And noir is full of very interesting characters, anti-heroes, who, like all of us, are flawed and tarnished by life's experiences. Indeed, my favorite course when I was an undergrad at Columbia was Development of Freudian Theory, taught by the renowned Freudian psychoanalyst, Dr. Willard Galen. My interest in psychoanalysis certainly fueled my interest in film noir which is replete with psychological motifs. And of course, a very good way to get to know and understand your parents is to watch the films from their formative years. <laughs> For my parents, who were teenagers during the Depression and uh, young adults during World War II and, and post-World War II, 
Film noir was the obvious choice of films to watch and study. And what better than the films of Cornell Woolwich? <coughs> I hope you all enjoy the festival. Now let's go into the night with Cornell Woolwich. Thank you. I'm Rob King at the School of the Arts. Um, the idea for this second iteration of the uh, Cape Film Noir Festival was suggested to me almost exactly a year ago on the final day of the festival's first iteration last year. Uh, we had just screened Robert C. Odmack's Phantom Lady, uh, adaptation of Phantom Lady, when Anne Douglas uh, noted to me that Cornell Woolrich, the author of the source novel, uh, was himself a Columbia student, so why not run a whole series of Cornell Woolrich adaptations next year? Now, at the time that Anne made that suggestion to me, I'll confess that only a few titles immediately popped to my mind. Uh, Phantom Lady, but of course we couldn't show that again. Uh, Black Angel, Rear Window, Deadline at Dawn, and then I was kind of not getting any more titles. Not exactly a festival, I thought maybe we could have like a, a Woolrich day, but uh, who knew what a Pandora's box I had been led to open, because Woolrich has had his novels adapted into nearly 40 films, and even if we narrow our purview to the classic noir period of the early 40s through the mid-50s, we're looking at at least 18 Hollywood adaptations, as well as over 70 radio dramas, uh, which you could hear actually piped in through the sound system in the lobby outside, uh, and the beginnings of an equally rich crop of TV adaptations that would extend into the 1960s. And that's for a very bountiful scene. Uh, thinking about it and tracking that scene, as we're going to be doing over the next five, five days, there's a number of consequences, it seems to me, for how we think about film noir. For one thing, it allows us to rethink noir's literary precursors, to decenter the long-acknowledged influence of hard-boiled writers like Chandler, Hammett, Kane. Woolrich isn't really a hard-boiled author. His work is much more gothic, more nightmarish, even more romantic. And the Poe of the 20th century is how he's been described by his biographer, Francis Nevins. Tracking Woolrich's influence also allows us to rethink film noir as, in fact, part of a broader noir media scape that also included thriller magazines like Ellery Queen or Black Mask, to which Woolrich contributed stories or radio anthologies like Suspense, to which Woolrich contributed, TV shows like Alfred Hitchcock Presents, to which Woolrich also contributed. And finally, screening these films here at the Lenfer Center allows us to uh, experience Woolrich's vision within just a mile or two of the spaces where his fiction was actually written. Woolrich's life was lived almost entirely in and around Morningside Heights, uh, in particular at the uh, Hotel Marseille, uh, where he lived for many years with his mother. And that still stands if you want to do a little bit of Woolwich-related tourism while you're here. Uh, it's at the southwest corner of Broadway and 103rd Street. So this year's Noir Festival really does allow us to bring his paranoid vision uh, back to the stomping grounds from which it emerged. Um, and actually, if you also do want to slake your Woolrich first thirst outside of this festival, um, I'd also note that there's an exhibit at Butler Library uh, on the sixth floor of Butler Library, uh, which shows some of the items from the Cornell Woolrich collection. Some people that I'd like to thank uh, quickly uh, Gordon Kidd, of course, for his vision and support. Our projectionists, Marcel Forres and Dan Meason. Uh, Jennifer Lee, the librarian uh, who is in charge of the Woolrich co collection. Sam Fentress and uh, Matthew Rivera, who can see her here, uh, for making the trailer uh, for the festival, which you will see many times over the course of the next several days, and you will not grow tired of it, I promise. Uh, the Lenfest management, especially Lauren Weigel, uh, Brendan Regible, Blake Kyle, Natasha Norton, Jack Lynch, the core team that I work with on the Noir Festival, Christina Rumpf, Roberta Albert, Elaine Rooney, and Gavin Browning, and last and definitely not least, uh, Sahel Reziasdi, who is the festival manager, who is absolutely indefatigable and with whom I wrote the, uh, the program. Um, 
I'm the kind of person who finds it very hard to delegate ordinarily on the kind of assumption that you know if you want it done properly. Uh, but uh, fortunately, or unfortunately for Sahil, uh, <laughs> he does it properly. Uh, so at any rate, let me now get the show on the road. Uh, James Naramore is a Chancellor's Professor Emeritus at Indiana University and the author of the award-winning uh, More Than Night, Film Noir in Its Contexts. He's taught and lectured at numerous universities in the US and abroad and has been the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim, the National Gallery of Art, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. His books include The Magic World of Orson Welles, Acting in the Cinema, the films of Vincent Minnelli on Kubrick, Charles Burnett, a cinema of symbolic knowledge. And his most recent publication, published just this year, is Film Noir, a very short introduction. Um, so uh, actually, before I bring him up to the stage, I would like to, uh, to note that when we had the Film Noir Festival last year, uh, James was 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 uh, going to attend. In fact, he came to New York only for the whole thing to be snowed off, at least his, his lecture. Uh, so we spent a day trapped in his hotel room, <coughs> Woolwich style, I guess, while the snow was outside. Uh, so now I'm very proud to be able to introduce, at last, uh, Professor James Narrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is very nice of you. Am I okay? Can you hear me all? Very well? Good. Uh, I have to explain this cane. Paul Strong. How are you? Wow. Um, I, uh, two months ago, uh, I, an inner ear weirdness happened to me. And nobody's exactly sure why. They say it will eventually go away. I'm taking physical therapy for it. It's getting better. But it throws me off balance, especially when I've been sitting for a while. So, but I'll be okay. Um, I need to thank you for inviting me again. Uh, actually, it wasn't a Woolrich night at the hotel. It's a great Italian restaurant right across the street. Uh, they said it was snowed out, and I looked around me, and if this was Chicago, we'd just call it March. I mean, it's not. Uh, anyway. Uh, so uh, they asked me to come back to talk about Woolrich, and I really hadn't thought very much about Woolrich before. And, and I knew that he was a graduate of Columbia University and that he had endowed this school uh, very nice. I think it's a creative writing fellowship, I guess, that he does here. Uh, and I thought, well, it's Columbia. It's just going to be bringing coals to Newcastle. Uh, so I hope I'll be able to say something you don't already know. Okay, uh, so I'm going to show you some slides as we go along. Uh, uh, this is a picture of Woolrich. I think there's a, uh, I think he has his Edgar Award on his desk. I'm not sure that's what it, what it looks like. Um, Cornell George Hopley Woolrich, uh, 1903 to 1968. He was among the most prolific of noir crime writers, and as far as I can determine, the most adapted for film, radio, and TV. His admirers regret that he wasn't given the literary respect accorded to Hammett and Chandler, but this is probably because his language is unremarkable, and his plots, which are his strength, test plausibility. He owes something to Edgar Allan Poe's terror tales, although most of his doom-ridden twist of fate narratives are set in 20th century New York, where the inhabitants suffer guilt, uh, anxiety, paranoia, and claustrophobic entrapment. <laughs> the titles of the novels and stories convey their fraught, doomed atmosphere, the black path of fear. <coughs> Night has a thousand eyes. I wouldn't be in your shoes. <laughs> the corpse next door. The living lie down with the dead, etc. <laughs> At its most effective, Woolrich, Woolrich's prose has the repetitive quality of an anxiously beating heart or the incessant drip of water torture. Consider, consider the opening of uh, the Black Curtain. Then he could feel hands fumbling around him. They weren't actually touching him. They were touching things that touched him. Or this. 
from uh, Black Angel. He looked at the wall opposite him, and it wasn't to be found there. He looked at the ceiling, and it wasn't there. He looked at his empty hands, and it wasn't there. Or the first chapter of I Married a Dead Man, which keeps repeating, but not for us. It's a language of bewildered suspense and anxiety verging on hysteria, and the plots duplicate the repetitive effect. Uh, I'm going to talk about Welwich as a writer now for a little while, so we'll take the images off. <clears throat> in the Ride War Black, the victims of a vengeful widow are disposed of like ducks in a shooting gallery. In Black Alibi, a serial killer brutally murders people at random. In The Black Angel, a woman tries to save her husband from a murder charge by questioning four suspects whose names begin with the letter M. One of them refuses to talk until she goes on a frightening late night errand involving four locations, a low rent cafeteria, a bar, a dance hall, and an all night movie theater, where she has to ritually repeat the same actions. The serial events or repetitions are appropriate to Woolrich's obsessive characters <clears throat> who suffer from amnesia, disability, and alcoholic blackouts, or who fall into fantastic situations in which nobody believes them. Many of the plots have an is this happening or am I crazy quality. In the short story, All at Once Know Alice, for example, circumstances force a husband and wife to spend their wedding night apart from one another in an unfamiliar town where the hotel has only one extremely tiny available room. When the husband returns the next day, every trace of the wife is gone and everyone who saw her, the manager, the staff of the hotel, and even the justice of the peace who married them, says she never existed. Like Dickens, the Surrealists, and Hitchcock, Woolrich also is a master of chance and ironic coincidence. A rule of thumb for most popular writers is that a dramatic accident ought to come at the beginning rather than the ending of the tale where it can seem like a deus ex machina. But the rule can be broken, as it is in Romeo and Juliet, for example. For his part, Woolrich salts accidental happenings throughout, and usually reserves the violent ones for the openings. A man walking down the street is knocked out by bricks falling from a building, and when he regains consciousness, he realizes he's been suffering from amnesia and may have killed someone. Two pregnant women who have never met share a seat on a train, and when the train suddenly crashes, the woman who survives changes identity with the one who's killed. It's a world in which arbitrary events or strange meetings create shock, reveal hidden social connections, and suggest a malign fatality. In the Woolworth story, Borrowed Crime, for example, an impoverished man confesses to a murder he didn't commit in order to collect a thousand dollar reward from a newspaper. His plan is to use the money so that his wife can take their extremely ill son to Arizona, where the boy's weakened lungs can benefit from the dry, sunny climate. The plan works. But while in, while in jail, the man discovers that his wife has been killed in an Arizona traffic accident. These stories sometimes end happily, as that one more or less does. <laughs> but even when they do, they leave an aftertaste of dread. Woolrich specialized in mystery, suspense, and fear, but the sense of dread made his pulp fiction distinctive. In certain respects, dread was also symptomatic of cultural modernism. Freud, for example, makes an important distinction between fear and angst, which is the German word for dread. Fearful emotion, Freud says, is a fight-or-flight response to a specific danger, such as a snarling tiger or a man with a gun. Suspense is also a fearful response, but it has a longer temporal span, <clears throat> arising from awareness of an actual imminent danger that may or may not happen, but has a deadline. Angst, or dread, is more like a free-floating global anxiety, and it pervades post-World War I psychology, art, and philosophy. It can be found in Kafka, in German Expressionism, perhaps above all in Heidegger, who describes dread angst as an existential condition arising from knowledge that one's death is inevitable. 
Heidegger, in turn, was an influence on French existentialism during and after World War II, when Sartre developed his ideas of being and nothingness, and when writers like Woolrich became important for both the French cinema and the popular media. Now, I don't mean that Woolrich was an existentialist, or that he was interested in any of the figures I've mentioned. He may have been, who knows. The effect of dread in his work goes hand in hand with the kind of murder stories he wrote. And it's an ambiance rather than a philosophy. But Woolrich's life was certainly dreadful, even tragic. Born in New York around the turn of the century, he was a child of divorce and lived with his father in Mexico before moving back to Manhattan to live with his mother. He attended Columbia University, but was apparently uninterested in English studies and took up writing, writing imitations of Scott Fitzgerald's jazz era novels. After a brief unsuccessful stint in Hollywood, where he had a failed marriage and spent time cruising in a sailor suit, <coughs> he returned to New York and began writing crime fiction, at which he became so speedy and proficient that he wrote under his own name and two pen names, William Irish and George Hopley. And in, in, in the discussion that follows here, I'm, I'm going to refer to Woolrich as the author of all the fiction, because there's no clear-cut distinction between him, Irish, and Hopley. He and his mother lived in hotels, as you heard, until her death in 1957, when he moved to another hotel and became a recluse. A closeted homosexual, he was also alcoholic, emaciated, and diabetic. Because of an untreated foot infection, the delay in treatment ironically susceptible to Pop Freudian analysis, one of his legs was amputated and he spent his last years in a wheelchair. During his early career, Woolrich published a serialized novel in college humor that was adapted by Hollywood in 1929. And when he turned to the pulps, he authored romance stories and a vampire tale. The crime stories and novels he began to write around 1934 belong to a genre known in the trade as thrillers. You have to bear in mind the term film noir is a latecomer to all this. <clears throat> These thrillers differ from the whodunits of the interwar years, most of which have a, a what will have happened or a future perfect plot. A murder occurs, but we don't get the full story of the killing until it's reconstructed in the last chapter by a detective who's never been in personal danger. The hard-boiled thrillers of Hammett and Chandler change the pattern by giving us detectives who are subject to gunfire and violent beatings. They retain the mystery element, but give primary attention to action and descriptions of an adventurous milieu. Wrong man thrillers, which often have a travelogue or chase structure and became a Hitchcock specialty, go a step further, upping the suspense by making the protagonist a victim, an investigator, and in the eyes of the law, a killer. The Woolrich thriller, in contrast to these, typically begins as a mystery but creates suspense and a vague atmosphere of dread because the protagonist tends to be an inexperienced and highly vulnerable investigator. A female secretary, a housewife, a pregnant single mother, a traumatized veteran, an unemployed father with a chick sick child, a pre-adolescent boy, or a man with a broken leg. Francis M. Nevins Jr.'s valuable biobibliography of Woolrich lists, by my count, 23 Hollywood adaptations of his work between 1929 and 1984, plus an incomplete list of adaptations from Argentina, France, Germany, Japan, and even the USSR. He was adapted not only by such major Hollywood directors as Hitchcock, but also by such Europeans as Francois Truffaut and Rainer Fassbender. In terms of frequency of adaptation, he isn't in shouting distance of Shakespeare, Jane Austen, or Conan Doyle. But he's accounted for more film noirs than anybody I can name. Why so many? Obviously, he wrote a great deal. But the situations he created also appeared at the right moment. Woolrich has been described by his publishers as the father of literary noir which makes no more sense than the claim that the Maltese Falcon was the first film noir. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett's novel about the Black Bird was published in 1929, and James M. Cain's The Postman Always Rings Twice in 1934, so that both writers have better claims to the dubious status of fatherhood. 
Francis Marcel Duhamel may have the best claim of all, because when he began editing Gallimard Publishing Company's Série Noire in the mid-1940s, he gave American writers a designation that had been known to France since the 1930s and didn't become widely known in America until the 1970s. <clears throat> Whatever the case, Woolrich is a key figure in a period we retrospectively call America's noir decades, which extend from roughly the mid-1930s until 1960. His fiction deals with urban life during and after the Depression and World War II, and he's largely responsible for an especially dark strand of noir centering on vulnerable people in an apparently indifferent world whose lives are subject to events beyond their control. Starting in 1940, Woolrich wrote six novels with black in the title, four of which were soon adapted into movies. And beginning in 1937, he published 22 stories for Black Mask, three of which were very soon adapted. His work succeeded not only because it often centered on vulnerable characters, often female characters, but also because it participated in a 1940s and 50s form of psychological suspense and macabre, almost darkly humorous situations. Edgar G. Ulmer's celebrated B-movie Detour, 1945, which is based on a novel by Martin Goldsmith, is very close to the kind of desperation one finds in Woolrich. And the novels of Frederick Brown and later Patricia Highsmith share in his bleak ironies. One of the best places to find such fiction in the mass culture of the period, which you already have heard reference to, in fact, you, you, you may have heard piped in from outside the ad for Roma Wine, um, one of the best places to find this was the CBS radio's highly popular Suspense, which featured a galaxy of Hollywood stars. James Stewart played a doctor who tries to escape his marriage by faking his death. Mickey Rooney played a murderous jazz musician who hears drums in his head. Ida Lupino played a career woman whose ex-con husband threatens to shoot her. The show premiered in 1942 and eventuated in over 900 episodes. The most successful single broadcast was Lucille Fletcher's 1943 drama, Sorry, Wrong Number, starring the great Agnes Moorhead. That's Agnes. Agnes. It's a Woolrich-like plot, which in 1948 became a, a film noir starring Barbara Stanley. Woolrich was adapted over 30 times on Suspense and more than once on Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which resembled Suspense and was one of the most popular TV shows in America during the 1950s. In cinema, he's been adapted so often and in so many countries that an adequate discussion of even the most important films would require a book. Hollywood didn't always do him justice because the classic studios tried to alleviate the most brutal violence and darkest moods of his fiction. On the few of the occasions when Hollywood gave Woolwich an upbeat or happy ending, however, they left an after effect of something unresolved, because the conditions that had given rise to an atmosphere of anxiety couldn't be completely eliminated. Here, by way of illustration, and without the detailed criticism many of them deserve, are my notes on seven of my favorite Woolwich adaptations, many of which you're going to see here in, in this series. And seven of, seven of these Hollywood features, plus one TV show, and I've arranged them in chronological order. One, Val Luton and Jacques Tourneur's B-Budget, The Leopard Man, 1943, based on Woolrich's violent serial killer novel, Black Alibi, was produced at RKO, which abandoned Woolrich's title in order to capitalize on the sleeper success of Luton and Tourneur's equally low budget, Cat People in 1942, an innovative supernatural horror picture that learns, earns significant profit for the studio. The Leopard Man isn't supernatural, but it shows the family relationship between film noir and a cinematic tradition of aestheticized, romantically uh, poetic horror, mostly European in origin, to which Luton and Tournure made several contributions. The film was shot in roughly a month on sets representing New Mexico instead of the Latin American locale of the Woolrich novel. 
Wikipedia describes it, and you don't want to trust Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia describes it as the first serial killer movie. But the attempt to name the first film of any type is a mug's game. Fritz Lang's M in 1930 precedes The Leopard Man by over a decade. And other serial killer films have been traced back as far as 1909. In any case, The Leopard Man involves three murders, the first of which, though treated indirectly, is the bloodiest violence in any of the Luton productions. A young Mexican girl is sent out at night by her mother to buy flour. And en route, she experiences what Luton called a bus moment. It's a term derived from a famous scene in Cat People when the sound of an arriving bus gives the audience a jump scare. The girl sees a leopard, spills the flour, and runs home in terror, pounding and screaming on her locked door. Turnyard cuts to the inside of the house. The mother, irritated with the child, is slow to respond, and when she opens the door, her daughter's blood floods over the lintel. Nothing in the film afterward is equally disturbing. But as Joel E. Siegel, in his book on Luton, has pointed out, Luton's woman screenwriter, Ardell Ray, inspired by the serial structure of Woolrich's novel, achieved something unusual. The Leopard Man is a film without a strong central character, and it moves almost like an anthology from one murder to another. <clears throat> it also has an unusual climax, less spectacular than Woolrich, but haunting in the matter in the manner of to Europe, involving a nocturnal chase through a bizarre procession of black hooded mendicants who are walking along a studio recreated desert. Sorry, I should have shown you that a little earlier. Okay. <laughs> Two. And you but people have been going to the series, you saw this movie last time with no doubt in uh, an excellent talk by Thomas Alsasser. It's Robert C. Odomack's Phantom Lady in 1944, produced by Universal, uh, Universal by Hitchcock's talented associate, Joan Harrison. Ella Raines stars as an intrepid secretary named Kansas, a character and a name that's appropriate for Howard Hawks, who sets out to prove that her boss, on whom she has a crush, isn't guilty of murdering his wife. The film gives this character more importance than she had in the novel. It not only changes her name and makes her a working woman, but also transforms her into a tough, relatively independent agent. Her search for a mysterious female in a flamboyant hat <clears throat> leads her through a studio created, hallucinated New York, and a series of dangerous encounters with men, but she never shrinks. The most cinematically affected effective episode <clears throat> is filled with shadows and heels clicking on wet pavement, begins when Kansas goes to a bar, stares down the bartender until the place closes, and then tracks in through the night <clears throat> until they're alone on an elevated train platform. Later, she impersonates a floozy in order to gain information from Elisha Cook, Jr., the quintessential noir character actor, who plays uh, a sex-crazed jazz drummer. A midnight jam session featuring Cook's drumming is a delirious montage of low angles and lens distortions, creating the impression of libidinal jungle music. <laughs> Cook leers, Ella Raines smacks gum and shows her legs, and they exit together into the night. In the end, however, he's no match for her. In another Phantom Lady's Departures from Woolrich, we learn the identity of the killer before he's discovered by any of the characters. A change of plot that turns the final third of the film into a pure suspense story. The culprit is a handsome, charming friend of Kansas's boss who has periodic migraines that turn his artistic hands into weapons. Suspense mounts when he assists Kansas with the investigation. The concluding scenes, for me anyway, are relatively disappointing because the villainy is overplayed and the happy ending is too cute, out of key with the rest of the film. Three, Black Angel, 1946, also from Universal, is given high praise from Woolrich biographer Francis Nevins, who declares, quote, if a single theatrical feature based on a Woolrich book could be preserved for future generations, Black Angel is the one I would opt to keep. But as Nevins explains, the film is different from the novel 
and Woolrich seems to have disliked it. When Columbia University's distinguished professor Mark Van Doren wrote Woolrich to say how much he enjoyed seeing the author's names in, in the credits, Woolrich went out to see the picture and confessed to Van Doren that he felt nothing but shame and embarrassment. <laughs> Black Angel is nevertheless skillfully directed by the unsung auteur Roy William Neal, who is known chiefly for his modernized pictures about Sherlock Holmes. By the way, one of these, The Woman in Green, 1945, has canted camera angles before Carol Reed ever thought of them and could easily be turned a film noir. Black Angel also preserves several distinctive qualities of the Woolrich imagination. June Vincent plays a woman whose husband is sentenced to death for the murder of his mistress. Again, we have a female searching for a killer, but she's aided, <coughs> she's aided throughout by an alcoholic pianist played by Dan Durier, who was once married to the murder victim and is subject to drunken blackouts. By fortuitous coincidence, one of these many coincidences in, 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 in Woolwich, Vincent was a professional singer before her marriage. Durier stops drinking, Vincent forms an act with him, and they take a job in a nightclub <clears throat> where they can investigate the sinister, suspicious Peter Laurie, who plays every scene with louche poses and a cigarette dangling from his lips. <laughs> Suspense ensues during the investigation, and as with Phantom Lady, the true killer is eventually discovered with a little help from a police detective. <clears throat> but Black Angel differs from Phantom Lady because the killer isn't a cliched madman. The conclusion satisfies the demands of the Hollywood production code by punishing the guilty, rescuing the innocent, and preserving a marriage but it has an ironically downbeat quality. June Vincent might have been happier with the murderer than with her philandering husband. Four, Arthur Ripley's The Chase, 1946, based on Woolridge's The Black Path of Fear, separates the mystery addicts from the surrealists. Many viewers, viewers find it laughably absurd, but to me it's fascinating. Eddie Muller, quoted on the jacket of the current DVD edition, is correct when he says it's the closest thing in the classic studio era to a David Lynch movie. Much like Lynch's Lost Highway and Mulholland Drive, it achieves what French surrealists Raymond Bourde and Etienne Chomuton regarded as the ideal noirness. Lynch, for his part, converts familiar plots, characters, and iconography into pure dream work. The Chase is less sophisticated than Vanguard, but in a decade when Hollywood was influenced by surrealist design and oniric effects were fashionable, it has not only surrealist decor, but also the second longest dream sequence in all of noir, surpassed only by Fritz Lang's The Woman in the Window in 1944. I digress here for a moment. While in Germany, Fritz Lang had a chance to direct another lengthy dream, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, 1919. He was unable to take the job, but he suggested that the film should have a framing narrative, or what the Germans call a Rahmenhandlung, motivating exp expressionist distortions by explaining them as the dream of a madman in a mental institution. This suggestion was followed and in some quarters has been severely criticized, most notably by Siegfried Krakauer in From Caligari to Hitler, who regards it as a concession to authoritarianism. The Woman in the Window, the other Fritz Lang film, also, and, and The Chase, they, they employ more deceptive varieties of Robin Handlung, and they too have been criticized for cheating their ways to happy endings. But all three films, I think, can be defended because the framing scenes don't contradict the larger aims or thematic elements. In The Chase, the strategy is particularly effective because there's almost no clue indicating the start of the dream and waking life is as surreal as dreaming life. <coughs> Produced by Seymour Navenzall, the producer of both Lang's M and Joseph Losey's 1950 remake of M, The Chase turns Woolrich's novel into a strange mix of waking and, and sleeping. The film stars Robert Cummings, who's usually more effective in light comedy than drama, as a newly discharged, unemployed veteran who suffers from bouts of wartime fever. At first sight, he seems comic, 
standing outside a Miami cafe wearing an old suit with a ruptured duck in the lapel. He smiles as he watches a cook at work. Then he leans forward in hunger, mashing his hat brim against the window. <clears throat> Suddenly, in one of those coincidences that happen only in Hollywood and in Woolwich, he notices an expensive wallet on the sidewalk at his feet. After purchasing a big breakfast, Cummings returns the wallet to its, uh, to, its owner, to its owner, a Miami gangster played by Steve Cochran, who lives in a mansion that looks as if it was decorated by Salvador Dali. <laughs> Cochran is a moody sadist who beats up his female manicurist for nicking his finger, and at every opportunity abuses his beautiful wife, played by Michelle Morgan. His equally sadistic assistant is played by Peter Lorre, once again with a cigarette dangling from his lips. <laughs> Amused by Cummings' honesty, Cochran gives him a job as his chauffeur. Hidden on the backseat floor of the gangster's big Cadillac is a gizmo that belonged in, in my era to a Saturday afternoon cereal. An extra gas pedal and brake with a switch enabling Cochran to take control of the car and almost bust the speedometer. Cummings puts up with Cochran's dangerous practical joking but feels concerned for Morgan who pleads with him to escape with her to Havana. They take a boat to Cuba, but danger awaits. Franz, uh, Franz Planner's black and white photography is wonderfully shadowy, and Cummings, as you can see here, wears the most glamorous white fedora in the history of film noir. <laughs> For the sake of those who haven't seen the film, I won't say what happens, nor will I say when the dreaming begins or ends. But at the conclusion, which you may or, not, may or may not consider happy, Cummings and Morgan repeat their history. A doomed Woolrich-like atmosphere persists because the two lovers are in the same place and in the same costumes they wore as when prior deadly events began. Five. Two impressive films were, based, were derived from Woolrich stories about characters who claim they've seen a murder and can't find anyone to believe them. The first, The Window, a modestly budgeted picture directed by Ted Tatslaff, is the only screen adaptation of Woolrich that gives documentary evidence of what areas of New York City looked like when he was writing. It's symptomatic of Hollywood's turn toward location shooting after World War II and belongs in company with an increasing number of, of thrillers filmed documentary style in the city. Producer Frederick Ullman, who had recently, uh, previously worked with Pathé News, arranged for exteriors to be shot mainly along East 67th, 103rd, 106th, and uh, the 3rd Avenue L. The film was completed in 1947, but not released until 1949, probably because RKO thought the unglamorous setting, lack of stars, and a relatively simple boy who cried wolf story would have little commercial appeal. It turned out to be an award-winning hit, popular with both critics and audiences, and it hasn't lost any of its quality. <clears throat> Bobby Driscoll, the, act, the child actor who plays the central role, was so effective that the Motion Picture Academy awarded him a miniature Oscar. <laughs> the boy played by uh, Driscoll lives with working-class parents, Arthur Kennedy and Barbara Hale, in a tenement where everything is in disrepair. There's no air conditioning, and the city is in the midst of a heat wave. Kids improvise summer activity. They play stickball in the crowded streets, shoot marbles in the dirt at the bottom of abandoned buildings, and occasionally chase fire trucks. No girls are in sight. Mothers string wet laundry outside their windows, and boys create imaginary adventure by scampering across the rooftops and up and down fire escapes. By the way, one title under which the Woolrich novelette appeared was Fire Escape. The film's only significant inaccuracy is that the neighborhood seems all white, on the bottom edge of the proletariat, but with no ethnic diversity. The boy at the center of the action has a vivid imagination and a habit of telling tall tales. His father works nights, and one evening, when he and his mother are sweltering, he gets her permission to take a pillow under the fire escape so he can sleep in the night air. Searching for a breeze, he goes up to the next level where, through a, a half-open window, he sees the upstairs neighbors, Ruth Roman and the always excellent Paul Stewart, commit murder. 
He rushes back to tell his mother, but she's exasperated with his fantastic stories and tells him he's had a nightmare. The murder is less violent <coughs> than the Willard story. The boy's parents are more sympathetic, and the film as a whole is less centered on the boy's point of view. As in Woolwich, however, one of the chief ironies and engines of suspense is that when the boy keeps insisting that he's telling the truth, his parents' efforts to discipline him put him in increasing danger of being killed by the neighbors. At one point, a frustrated father puts the boy in his room and nails the door shut to keep him out of mischief, thus making him easy prey. As tension mounts, another, another irony develops. The mean streets outside seem liberating and the interiors of the tenement become a barred cage trap, an effect highlighted by Robert Degrassi's photography, which emphasizes slatted windows and barriers. At the end, all is redeemed and the boy's parents are made proud. But only a moment of reflection should leave us uneasy about the cheerfulness. The father still works nights, the mother is still burdened by chores, and the neighborhood is still dangerous. As the boy complains at an earlier point, there's no place to go. Six, No Man of Her Own, 1950, is an expensive Paramount production directed by Mitchell Lysen and starring Barbara Stanwyck. It's a blend of noir and family melodrama. Screenwriters Catherine Tunney and Sally Benson, Sally Benson, by the way, was, was the author of the stories that became MGM's Meet Me in St. Louis. They remain true to Woolrich's I Married a Dead Man, except at the closing. Near the beginning of the film, we see a pregnant Stanwyck struggling with luggage up several flights of a shabby apartment building. She pounds on an unanswered door, cries, and pleads with the man inside. He's handsome Lyle Betker, the father of her child, who has a new girlfriend. Ignoring Stanwyck's pleas, Betker shoves a train ticket out of town and five dollars under the door. The humiliated Stanwyck accidentally drops the money in the hallway, but takes the train, which is so crowded she has no seat. Another, another pregnant woman notices her, nudges her husband to make room, and strikes up a friendship. In the most jaw-dropping accident and coup de théâtre in all of Woolrich, the two women are in the toilet, and Stanwyck is for a moment wearing her new friend's wedding ring as the train crashes, killing both the new newlyweds who were on their way to introduce the husband's wife to the family. To save her child, who is born immediately after the accident, Stanwyck assumes the dead wife's identity. She arrives in an idyllic Midwestern town and is welcomed into the arms of a wealthy, loving family who treat her as their daughter. As time goes by, a romance develops between her and the dead husband's brother, played by John Lund. <clears throat> Everything's perfect, but one evening at a country club dance, just as Stanwyck and Lund are planning marriage, the smarmy Betker appears from out of the past with blackmail on his mind. Eventually, Stanwyck finds herself seated at the wheel of a car on a dark night as Lund disposes of a body. It's an ironic echo of a scene in Double Indemnity in which a cold-blooded Barbara sits behind the wheel while Fred McMurray does the dirty work. Billy Wilder, who started out at Paramount working under Mitchell Lyson <clears throat> and intensely disliked Mitchell Lyson, <laughs> probably wasn't amused by this. The Woolrich novel ended with a nest of complications that left the Stanwyck and Lund characters free of the law but mutually suspicious of one another in a state of perpetual guilt and dread. No man of her own <clears throat> invents a clever way out of Stanwyck's problem. The witty conclusion allows some of the audience to believe that she and Lund will live happily ever after. But of course, everything depends on exactly where you choose to end your story. Personally, I doubt that as time passes, either character can escape the memory of what they've experienced. Seven, the best film based on Woolrich, and indeed one of the best films in history, it's on my, my, it's on my top ten list, is Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. 1954, which is derived from a novella originally published under the title, It Had to Be Murder. The novella was subsequently published as Murder from a Fixed Position, uh, and then after the film appeared as Rear Window. So much has been written about this picture that little needs to be said. 
But not everyone thinks Rear Window is a film noir. In an interesting essay on Woolrich and urban space, David Reed and Jane L. Walker declare flatly that it isn't. In part, they argue, because no movie with Thelma Ritter could possibly be called noir. <laughs> I assume they have not seen Sam Fuller's pickup on South Street. <laughs> but there are better reasons why noir, or why Rear Window seems only marginally noir-like. The most amusing and glamorous of Woolrich adaptations, it has gorgeously colorful Vis Division photography, a gigantic, charmingly pretty dollhouse set representing a Greenwich, Greenwich Village courtyard, a semi-bohemian but equally charming apartment, and a series of open windows across the way framed almost like movie screens. And to the delight of every voyeur, vignettes, redolent of Hollywood movies, little human interest stories played out in the windows, some comic, some sad, but spiced with sex and murder. Whether or not it's noir, Rear Window has little of the characteristic Woolrich ambiance. In the original story, the protagonist, a lonely, bored man named Jeffries, has a broken leg, no courtyard, no camera, no telephoto lens, and no amusement when he looks out his window. His only company is a black servant named Sam, who prepares meals and goes home every night. When Jeffries becomes convinced that a man in a nearby building has murdered his wife, he sends Sam to investigate and rewards him with a drink for completing the dangerous mission. You're as close to white as you'll ever be, Jeffries says. Hitchcock eliminates Sam and adds Grace Kelly in a designer dress, plus Thelma Ritter, a specialist in working class roles, as a wisecracking nurse from Brooklyn who gives James Stewart rubdowns. At the same time, Hitchcock achieves a cinematic tour de force, a sustained demonstration of the Kuleshov effect, a lesson in how to deploy several characters in a small room, and the elaboration of the Woolrich story into a fusion of romance, humor, and suspense. The last shot introduces a note of witty skepticism about the future of Kelly and Stewart, but it doesn't approach the moody pessimism of Woolrich. That's seven, and here's plus one. Hitchcock is much <clears throat> closer to Woolrich in Four O'Clock, a 51-minute TV film broadcast in 1957 on NBC TV's Suspicion. Scripted by Francis Cockrell, it's an adaptation of a Woolrich story called Three O'Clock. E.G. Marshall plays a small businessman who repairs watches and clocks and who believes his wife, Nancy Kelly, is having an affair. By the way, a bit role in this movie is played by an actor named Dean Stanton, better known to you as Harry Dean Stanton. The result is a superb example of what Hitchcock termed pure cinema. Hitchcock's style had derived from his experience in silent film, and early in this picture we have a long, mesmerizing, dialogue-free sequence in which Marshall methodically goes through the entire procedure of making and testing a time bomb. Later we have a dramatization of Woolrich's famous distinction between surprise and suspense. In his interview with Francois Truffaut, he described a scene in which two characters sit at a table chatting for several minutes about something innocuous, and suddenly a bomb goes off, blowing them to smithereens. The result, he said, is several minutes of boredom, followed by an instant of surprise. But imagine the same scene, he added, <clears throat> if the audience is informed in advance that there's a bomb under the table. The result is several minutes of suspense. When he spoke with Truffaut, Hitchcock may have been thinking of four o'clock, which has exactly the second type of scene, with the suspense prolonged for a longer time. The film might have been even more like pure cinema if it had dispensed with most, I think, if it had dispensed with most of E.G. Marshall's unnecessary interior monologue in the last half. But as the clock on the time bomb reaches its deadline and the plot tilts toward madness, the imagery and editing are in their own small way, as good as the shower scene in Psycho. The Woolrich story that inspired Four O'Clock was adapted three times on TV and twice on radio. And all the other Woolrich fiction uh, uh, that I've discussed was adapted more than once, sometimes by other media or other national cinemas, and occasionally in surprising form. I Married a Dead Man, the source of no man of her own, became a French thriller I Married a Shadow, a TV movie, She's No Angel, and believe it or not, 
a romantic comedy <clears throat> called Mrs. Winterbourne. Perhaps inevitably, however, a few of Woolrich's many novels and stories have yet to be adapted, and some of the best have yet to become significant films. Among the latter group is the 1947 novel Waltz into Darkness, which was the source of both Francois Truffaut's un-Woolrich-like Mississippi Mermaid and Michael Christopher's somewhat underrated Original Sin in, 19, in 2001. The masochistic eroticism and period flavor of the novel were captured more accurately in the Christopher film, which nevertheless failed at the box office. This failure, plus the major changes in the entertainment industry wrought by digital technology, may account for the fact that almost two decades have passed without a Woolrich-based theatrical feature. But the suspenseful situations Woolrich imagined will likely continue to be adapted. He never developed a series character such as Spade or Marlowe, who figured in many radio and TV shows not directly based on Hammett and Chandler. Yet he left behind many dark narratives that can be loosely adapted or reconfigured in a variety of ways. The sense of angst or existential dread he gave to popular fiction in the late 30s and 40s has a perennial quality. Old films based on him still have an audience, and he'll remain a richer source of plots and characters than most writers of crime fiction. We haven't seen the last of Woolwich. That's the last of me, though. <laughs> I wanted to take questions. I, is that right? Is that, is that correct? Yep. Yes. Well, I'll, if, should yes. it's okay, Rob? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll let's take a few of them. It's getting pretty late. So, anybody? Yeah. I'm, I'm never good at answering questions. So. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, somebody over here. So my question is, is there a social critique to Woolrich and could it perhaps, as I suggest, be found in his engagement with the urban environment or do you think that Woolrich is a weaker social critic? Um, sorry. Uh, he, I, I wouldn't describe Woolrich as a social critic. Uh, I don't know what his politics were. So he was a very private man. But the stories and, and novels, uh, uh, they just... They, they, as I say, they seem existentially despairing. They don't seem... They are social in the sense that they, I was interested in these vulnerable characters that I'm talking about. There are more women in, in his stories, and there are uh, uh, very poor people in his stories. Uh, so he gives us the point of view of people who are in desperate circumstances. But again, I... I think he's less a political writer than either Hammond or Chandler were. Let's put it that way. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a more general question, not a uh, Cornell Woolrich question. Why is it after the 50s, film noir went, uh, stopped? Uh, uh, could you explain? Film noir didn't stop in the 60s. People always say, uh, Paul Frager says it ended in 1958. That's nonsense. There are many film noirs after that, and they're still being made right now. Uh, and there are movies being publicized as film noirs, new movies being publicized. It's never gone away. There was a, there was a moment in the 60s when the, when the industry shifted completely to color uh, with, a, with, a, with a kind of Eastman color photography that required bright, high-key lighting. And that was never, not very good for the mood. Uh, but, but since then, the color has changed and people can make color quite dark. There are rich blacks in, in color film. So some of the atmosphere of the old 40s film continue. When, when uh, I'm trying to think of his name, I want to say his name is Michael, it's Michael Chapman, I think, photographed a uh, uh, taxi driver for uh, Scorsese. And he said, when we were making that movie, we watched a lot of old film more, Sweet Smell of Success, things like that. Uh, he said, uh, if, you're, if you're my age, uh, no movie's a real movie unless it's black and white. Anyway, uh, uh, but that, that's an instance. But there are many, many of the others. You, you can't name the last film noir, and you can't name the first one. Um, hi. Uh, thanks very much for 
the talk. I had a, yes. oh, a question you mentioned, um, Patricia Highsmith in yes. passing, and uh, I wondered if uh, how you might elaborate on a potential comparison between uh, Woolrich and, and Highsmith, uh, yeah. both with regard to their narratives, their characters, um, gender and sexuality, yeah. and uh, an adaptation by Hitchcock, yeah. uh, uh, among other um, relations between literature and film. I thought a little bit about that, but I'm not too clear in my own. The question is, how would I compare Patricia Highsmith and, and Woolrich? I greatly admire Patricia Highsmith. I, I like Patricia Highsmith more than Woolrich. That's just me. Uh, I think her work is uh, more deeply ironic, more 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 troubling and uh, creepy in certain ways that. Uh, uh, I think Woolrich doesn't doesn't get to, and uh, she's written at least one novel. I don't know. Uh, I think it's called *The Suspension of Mercy*. I don't know if you know that novel. Uh, that is a great novel. Uh, uh, it, it can compare with Camus with any uh, literary figure you can imagine of the period. And I don't think Woolrich ever rises that high. Woolrich is a pulp fiction writer, basically. Uh, I think Will uh, Highsmith aspires to something a little more. I don't know. Well, thank you very much for coming in.